Wizards analyst, Jason Smith, joins the show. Jason, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Uh, doing we are great. doing well. Um, it seemed like Twitter or some people on Twitter last night were losing their minds about Jordan Poole throwing the ball off the backboard to Kyle Kuzma while the Wizards are losing by, I think, 20 or 21 at that point in the loss to the Hawks. To you, as a former player and now analyst, big deal or not a big deal? I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's more being blown out of proportion. Um, it's one of those things where you're trying to go out there, you're trying to play free, and you got to take a look at where Jordan Poole came from in a certain situation. He came from the Golden State Warriors. That is probably one of the freest teams in the NBA. So for him, I think this is just kind of a learning curve and adjustment where everything is kind of very articulated over here on the Eastern Coast versus West Coast freedom over there. So I don't I don't see it as such a big deal. Um, it's it's a tough crowd right now. Obviously, there's high expectations for Jordan Poole coming over and having the freedom to do what he wants to do. But I think moving forward, it should be just fine. They just got to get back on the right track. I think one of the big things that they really missed last night was no Daniel Gafford. I mean, you want to make sure that he's healthy, but not having him on the floor definitely makes a difference. And the team as a whole still has a lot of new players. You saw the depth of the bench kind of get tested last night as well. So it, it's it's a tough go around right now, but I'm not looking too much into it. I mean, Jay, you rarely see a team get out-rebounded by 22. I mean, <laughs> that's bad. Yeah, it's it's not good. <laughs> that's for sure. It's not good. And, and I'm sure Gafford not being there had a lot to do with that. But, I mean, and I kind of thought about this before the season started. I didn't know how big they were. I, I just didn't think that they were a very big team. And, um, man, 57 boards to 35. Yeah, that's a tough one right there. That's where collectively they had to have the mindset of, all right, team rebound, especially going against like a Clint Capella. And the Hawks as a whole, they are a team that crashes the boards. Um, so it's – it's that learning curve that you're going to see go on from the beginning of the season. What is the identity of this team? And we, we haven't yet to see it. Um, are they going to be a work hard team? Are they going to be a, a team that is getting out and shooting a bunch of threes? I mean, they're trying to get up as many threes as possible, but in the, in flow of the offense, you kind of want to get up a good quality shot. And I'm thinking that it's going to take some time, obviously a lot of new guys, a lot of new faces. You got to figure out what coach wants from you, what the organization wants from you. But overall, the team needs to go out there and play with a sense of urgency because these are games right at the beginning of the season that could really set you up for postseason or playing game situation. But right now, that it just doesn't seem like there's much urgency out there. Yeah, I was going to say, I can tell you the identity that they're not, and that's a defensive team. They're giving up 126 <laughs> per game, and when I watch them, they like who are their best individual defenders? Is it Blal, who they just drafted? Like, one-on-one -on -one defense, I think they have a tough time keeping people in front of them. You know, it's funny that you say Bilal because he is one of the bright spots that I kind of looked at going in from summertime. I was like, who is this kid? Why, why would you go after a Wimanyama kind of guy that was on his team? But after seeing him just at the practice facility and summer league and now training camp and heading into the regular season, the kid's got fight. I mean, he is athletic, he's long, he's got a bright future. He's not afraid of the moment. I think that's the best thing that I like to see from him is that when he does make a mistake, say on the defensive end, he has that youth and athleticism to make up the ground. And then with his long wingspan, he's blocking shots like crazy. So I love to see the upside from him. He's going he's gonna to be a project for sure. But for now, I'm liking what I'm seeing from him. Overall, the Wizards, though, they got to play a little bit more urgency on the defensive end, obviously. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, you said we can score some points. <clears throat> oh, yeah. They're going to score a lot of points, but you're not going to be able to win very many games if you're not getting any stops on the defensive end. And I think that's something that's really just got to be getting on the same page, everybody being on a string. Uh, the chemistry level, like I said, it's got to be better. You're not going to get that right away, but it's going to take a little bit of time. So it's got to be a patience factor here. Another bright spot, a guy that gets overlooked because he doesn't score a lot, only three and a half points per game. DeLon Wright leads the team in assists at six and leads a, a bad defensive team in steals at nearly two per game. So that's a, ni that's a nice bench piece and, I guess, sometimes starter for Wes. You know, the, the, that is a bright spot for him, especially for him either coming off the bench or starting. Say if somebody gets hurt, there's always going to be injuries during the season. And that was one thing that kind of plagued the Wizards last year is that 
when he got hurt with his hamstring injury, he was out for a long period of time. The Wizards really struggled on the defensive end. He is a player that is a veteran player. He doesn't get frazzled by a lot of stuff out there. But he, as well as Bilal, is, has that length and has that anticipation factor, especially being in the league for as many years as he has. He knows what to anticipate with a bounce pass and a pick-and-roll scenario or a lob, and he has the anticipation factor to get those steals. What does that do? That fuels the offense going back in transition now. You want more consistency out there. It's tough to get a steal a game, two steals a game, but he does it consistently. So that's something that you can really pride yourself on. I think he does on the defensive end. He goes out there, plays really, really hard. And then on the offensive end, he gets people in the right position. So I'm liking what I'm seeing from DeLon. I was I was happy to see him come back this year. Hey, Jason, just to switch gears. So you got drafted by the Sixers, right? Uh, technically, I got drafted by the Miami Heat and then traded to the Sixers two minutes later. But, yes, <laughs> I played for the Sixers. For okay, I just wanted kind of maybe it's a cool story, maybe it's not. What was your first interaction with AI? You know, that's the crazy part about it is that AI had just gotten traded when I got drafted. So he had left and the organization was like, oh, this team's not very good. We actually made the playoffs that year. So we came back, we made the playoffs, but then – to go to an AI story. Now, are we talking about Andre Iguodala or are we talking about no, Allen Iverson? Iverson. <laughs> <laughs> Allen Iverson actually came back in my yeah. tenure in his second stint. And, man, let me tell you, his first game. Now, granted, you're Philly fans. you got to figure, okay, they're not going to welcome him with open arms. He said he wanted to get traded. He doesn't like Philly. He puts out this welcome video before the game. And we're warming up. It's probably like 15 minutes left. We're out there just doing layups. This was a packed house like I've never seen a packed house. Mm. We were a playoff team. We came back. This guy comes in a trade, and he puts out this welcome video. I have never heard that arena so loud for one man. He's doing layups, and and the video, you can kind of hear it in the background. We're obviously trying to pay attention to the court, but we kind of looked up. And I think the phrase was that I will always have love for Philly. I mean, the crowd goes nuts. Mm. I was okay, this is, this is about to be a little bit of fun out here. He put it out there on the line. He was getting his knee drained all the time to play in games. He was an all-star that year, voted in. So it, it was an amazing experience for me to, to play with that man right there because you hear all the stories and everything, but until you actually see it, he's not a very big guy. And right. for him to do the things that he did was absolutely incredible. Sick, sick athlete. Hey, real quick before we let you go, um, kind of just give us a sneak preview. And I'm kind of surprised. I just looked at this. I wasn't paying attention to standings, but the Wiz play the Heat tomorrow night down in Miami. Miami's off to a one and four start. Uh, I don't know if they have any injuries um, that you know to some of their starters. Uh, the last game they played against Brooklyn looked like all the big dogs were playing, but they're off to a one and four start. Uh, kind of give us a, a preview of that game. There is blood in the water. There is a potential for the Wizards to go out there and sneak a game out. I think it's a great opportunity for them as well because this is a good opportunity for the Wizards to get a good conference win. It's going to be a tough bout. Miami is never an easy team to play, and you definitely cannot play their record. This is a team that is very, very dangerous. And the Wizards can score the basketball. We have said that over and over and over, but I want to see who can get the consecutive stops. Whoever gets the stops in this game is going to get the win. Mm. All right, Jason, thanks as always for the time, man. We'll have to have you on again soon. Jason Smith, Wizards analyst. You are very welcome. Yep. Thank Thank you, man. Thank you.